guys can come on in in the back. I think if everybody moves in, we should have room. Keep the door clear. Yeah, so we here. I, uh, I'm floored by all this. And we got lots going on here, and uh, we want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to uh, hear Michael. We're learning so much from him. I'm like absorbing everything you say here. So in about 10 minutes, we'll probably just, I have the unenviable job of moving people. <laughs> It's not, it's not easy, don't hate me. But we'll give you a few minutes with Michael here, and thanks for coming. Cool. All right, awesome. So I am really, um, I'm going to try to speak as loud as I can. Use my, my preacher voice. Um, I am really humble and honored that there are so many people uh, here. Uh, wow. I was here 15 years ago. To, my, my puppy of blessed memory who uh, left this world this, earlier this year. I was here 15 years ago to get him from Woodbury, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> oh, y'all gonna laugh when I tell you. His, 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 uh, his, human, his, his human grandma, great-grandma, lived in Lake, Lake Roosevelt. So I was, you know, I don't know how young I was then, I don't think about it, but I'm gonna tell you something. Y'all ain't never seen me more scared in my life than when they had me in Minnesota in December walking on a frozen lake. <laughs> now I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, now I'm, I'm Jewish, I'm African American, and so I was walking on frozen water and I said, you know what? The last time a Jewish guy walked on water, <laughs> it didn't end up so good for him. The next thing I know, the, the, the lake come talking about boom. And they said, oh, no, don't worry. That's the lake freezing. <laughs> and I said, uh-uh, I got to get out of here. No. And it was below zero. My behind ain't never been no, I was never, had never been in chocolate sickle before. <laughs> I ain't never been in below zero temperatures before. So that was my introduction to Minnesota <laughs> and Ludafisk. The, uh, the only food that twerks. <laughs> Other than Jello. And um, no, I, I'm, the people here are really sweet and wonderful. And um, I have a deep appreciation. I used to work for your former governor, Jesse Ventura, in Washington for, for six months. I used to get co make coffee and get coffee, so don't blame me for nothing. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, Jesse and me, I was, on, I was sort of on the team. Um, apart from all that, I'm a culinary historian. Um, in that time period, same time period, I really focused my energies on pursuing something that's really near, near and near to me, which is a subject of the material culture of my African-American ancestors. I am um, really blessed to be able to have a full-time freelance life writing about their culture, their heritage, and also make connections with people of different backgrounds to also tell new stories about how everybody has a cooking gene and everybody has a very special relationship with food. Right now, I'm making uh, greens. We have some kale, we have some mustard and dandelion greens, we have some collard greens. And the reason why I want these three dishes, over here in the big kettle behind is our chicken and cabbage leaves. And the cabbage is not to be eaten. The cabbage is just kind of like the container. And the chicken will be in there until late this afternoon and what's going to happen is it's going to steam and go to bake in there it'll still turn brown the cabbage leaves around will burn them, but they'll give off their moisture which makes it make sure that the cabbage inside is moist so if you were in west africa you'd be using banana leaves but they adjusted what they had when they came here so when i walked into the space on went on thursday rather i was really shocked because you know you know as someone who works with this history that people of color were everywhere. They weren't just, you know, in the South or just this place. But when I learned that this is Mary's kitchen, they have names. You know how we say, say their name? Well, Mary was in this kitchen. And Louisa was in this kitchen. And Harriet Scott, wife of Dred Scott, was in this kitchen. And so when I learned that, it just, I don't know how, I, it was, I felt some kind of way. And then Sean Sherman, uh, my good friend, also a James Beard Award winner, the sous chef, talked about how his great-great-great-great-grandmother had been in prison here during the, during the Dakota Wars. And then here we are making a dinner, 
demonstrating the import and the influence of Native American and African foodways. And I'm like, wait a minute, this was never supposed to happen. This is a miracle. And so I said, everybody said, you're enjoying your meal, but our ancestors are cheerleading us on. Because this is a miracle that was even happening. But you know, that's why these spaces for me are very spiritual, very important. Because, you know, everybody who comes in the kitchen when I'm cooking, you know, I get stories from every background, people talking about, well, my grandma did this, I remember my father and I did this, or my mom and I used to, or my brothers and sisters and I used to catch the wild eye and do this, and da-da-da-da-da. And, you know, it's funny because the, it's, the space becomes a place where people feel safe to sort of start generating these narratives. And you see the faces that they, they make, it's the, the warm smile comes over their face, their children start listening. And they say, wow, I didn't know that about Uncle so-and-so. And so this is a way of remembering and passing on things to the next generation. And that's why cooking is so important. You know, when I was, that was this one's age, I was already <laughs> washing greens and doing this and doing that. And my grandma would sit me at the table, and she would sit up there and say, okay, don't move from the island. And so my grandmother was the, my grandmother was the official babysitter, and my babysitting space was the kitchen. And so... I have something for you. <laughs> <laughs> my grandmother cooked okra with me. You know what she would do? Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. <laughs> Give me a hand. Give me a hand. Stick your hand out like that. And my grandmother would go like this. I got a decoration for you. She'd go like this. Come on. She'd go, bam. And so you see how I stick to your hand? She said, don't let it move now. <laughs> and she go like this, she go like this, she go like this. She go like this, she go. Well, it used to stick better when I was younger. She <laughs> go like that. And I gave him my little horns. He say, don't let your horns fall off. And that's what my grandmother did. It kept me in the kitchen. So I still remember that. But making me eat okra okra was a black medieval torture. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, and nah. then you know, it's slimy. Oh, my God. Nah. Oh. oh, Lord. Not in chitlins. Couldn't get me to eat it. Now, I'm the <laughs> right. <laughs> I said, we have some veterans. <laughs> but see, you know, these are, this is a food that comes from West Africa. When I was in Ghana and Nigeria and Senegal, everybody eats okra soup. Okra soup plus a root equals what? Gumbo. Mm -hmm. There are Charleston okra soups and Savannah okra soups and all kinds of, of sauces and dishes across the new world. You go to Caribbean. Hallelujah. Ca thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Not Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Right. So you have all these different dishes that show you that we are a family divided up in different places. I know. I saw this mess on Twitter the other day ago. Somebody talked about African American versus Jamaican versus Nigerian, and I said, guess what? It doesn't matter where the boat dropped you off, where it picked you up from. Uh -huh. We are one family. That's right. No matter where you come, we're one family, and that's all there is to it. And by the way, because as African American cooks put the leafy greens and the hot peppers and the okra and the melons, and everything and the sweet potatoes, everything together, the rice, all that together, there are people who don't look like us who are family to us because they share the same food. Mm -hmm. So. Get somebody talking about, I said, I went to Nigeria and I said, you know something? I said, these Nigerian people, I said, I done seen a lot of white southern folks that look like these Nigerian people. I said, they go where they go on answers you're talking about. I need to wear, start wearing a kilt and some later hose. They need to come to Nigeria. Because, <laughs> I mean, you ask some of these folks, what you eat, okra, greens, fried chicken, hot sauce? Well, you need to go on in West Africa. That's where your heritage is. <laughs> you, know, you better bypass London. <laughs> they got nothing for you. So, you know, it's funny how we learn, we're learning new things about each other. And we're trying to, you know, are all of the storms we're living in right now, the one thing I can tell you gets everybody shutting up. When you put good food in their mouth, it make them chew. <laughs> Amen. So, um, I'm doing this little sermon, but I want you to know and understand how important it is for me to be in this space. 
um, used to being in Colonial Waynesburg or in Maryland or in South Carolina or in Mississippi, places where you would assume someone like me doing this work would be. But this is very unique, and it's, the importance of it is just to show you that this cooking tradition was everywhere. And it was not just the foundation of soul food and southern food, but American food. So it's so critical. So I thank you all very much mm -hmm. for uh, being here, making me feel very loved and validated. Because I was like, I'm going to Minnesota to a cooking demonstration. Five people going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> we, did, we did guarantee him a cooler day. <laughs> <laughs> that we were able to make good on. Yeah. Folks, we've got some people in That's the outer right. room that are waiting to come in. Awesome. I'm sorry, I have been very unmuted. Well, that was 10 job. minutes. Yeah. It felt like three. <laughs> so, I, you, you know, you can circle back around and anything. It's wonderful. And it's great because we put it above the fire. Fire gets in there and it gives you a nice, quick, fast heat. Yeah. It's going to be for the greens. So... So I was telling the group earlier, I'm trying to project a little more. One, two, three. <laughs> As I was telling the group earlier, um, it's really important to um, not put our assumptions, our modern, or I should say contemporary assumptions about food onto what we're doing here. What I do is I interpret the food ways of enslaved people and enslaved cooks. Enslaved cooks are cooking for themselves as a domestic unit and they're cooking for the people who hold them in bondage. They are cooking in kitchens high and low. They are cooking for small domestic spaces. They are cooking for officers quarters and they're cooking for big house kitchens and taverns and restaurants. Uh, from the first start, I said this earlier, I have to say it again and again and again and it's okay. Enslaved versus slave. Enslaved is a condition. Slave is an identity. These are not slaves. We are not talking about slaves at any given point. If anybody in this room would like to be three-fifths of a person, please let me know. So we are talking about enslaved people. They are not a caste. They are not a position. This is not the American Downton Abbey. <laughs> they are property, and it is unfortunate, but they are enslaved. That's their condition. So the way that they cooked was a bridge between African tradition from West Central and Southeast Africa to Western Europe to Native American food ways and ingredients from across the Americas and other influences. This is not a technique-based tradition. It's a tradition that is centered in how we feel about the food and how we flavor the food. It is not about sous vide and this and that and the other. You know, people ask me, what's my technique? I put it in a cast iron skillet, I cook it and it's done. That's my technique. It's part of this is passed down from our fathers and our mothers going back generation to generation. Our domestic cooking is primary female primarily female, and our celebration cooking is male. That is just the part of how we, how we are. I've been to West Africa, I've been fortunate in the past year to have been able to have gone to Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, and Ethiopia. So I have seen and eaten food on the continent and seen how it's produced in domestic spheres and in restaurant settings. And one of the most amazing things you see, the traditional restaurants, especially in Ghana, which are called chop bars, they prefer that the kitchen, which is an outdoor space behind the main building, is just like it with African-American culinary know-how, and they blackified it. And they made it taste better. So we have to consider all those different pieces. That Harriet Scott and Mary and Louisa, black women who were in this kitchen, on the edge of the, of the known part of America, there are 15 to 30 of these folks running around Plus free people of color. That's deep. They're the ones shaping American food ways until Ludacris shows up. <laughs> <laughs> That's when all hell broke loose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sure, yes, please. So they do the greens. This is very simple. 
This is not really um, uh, too complicated a recipe. It's not even a, you know, first of all, the notion of a recipe. If you're average enslaved cook, average enslaved person, we're the only people who are forbidden on pain of death to pick up a book. So the notion that they would somehow open up a book and get a recipe, where are they getting the recipes from? Tradition. From watching their elders cook. From seeing, from over and over, from being the people who gather the water, to building the fire, to, gather, to growing the ingredients. Enslaved people were not just cooking, they were doing all the other labors associated with the process. And that's critical. And they're also cultural conduits. They are absorbing and they are spreading the cultures of other people they come into contact with through the culinary trade. So to be African American was not to be in a, in a, in a, in a box. And yes, by the way, the term African American, although it's associated with contemporary identity politics, actually goes back to the 1770s. Our first notion of ourselves was not as Negro or colored, it was as African American people, a sovereign and independent ethnic group, because we really had no choice in coming here. So that is an imprint in Philadelphia in the 1770s, African American. And that's really important to know. So we are people who were enslaved to um, French folks. We ran away to the Creek and the Cherokee and the Choctaw and the Dakota. We were also um, part English and part Sephardic Jewish and German. We were also brought from 50 different ethnic groups in West Africa. So we were the most multi-ethnic people in early America. Part of my, some of my ancestors were brought all the way from Madagascar which is an island off the coast of Africa where half the population was Indonesian and it mixed with the Bantu population that was there. So our genetic bowl was more diverse than anybody else's and our cultural influence. So obviously we're bringing food and culture with us everywhere we go and everywhere we migrate to pick up new pieces and add them into our culinary repertoire. One of the most important parts about both English cooking in, in its colonial form and West African diaspora cooking is that they're both very good at absorbing other people's stuff and putting them in the format to which they're accustomed. You know, other cuisines are not very good at this. Ours is, it's, it's fluid. It's the, it's the cuisine of people in motion, of people in exile. You just learn how to incorporate things into a framework that you understand. Yes? Are these things in the book that you have written? Yes, thank you for the photo. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to, too. You're the health of a reading teacher, so. So, yes, and, and one of the things that I wanted to make plain about it was, you know, when I uh, finished the cooking gene and put it out into the world, the one, two, James Beard Awards, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I am now, I mean, I don't, I don't say that, I say this with, with a lot of humility, but not all the humility. <laughs> But it, it's something to note that in the history of the James Beard Awards, mm -hmm. I, this year we have the most decorated African Americans in the history of the awards. Mm -hmm. Eduardo Jordan for yeah. his restaurants and me for the media. Mm -hmm. Nobody is, none of us have ever received two. We both received two this year. That's more than in the history of the whole awards. But, right. yeah. and I remember being told when I did this project, you know, but when we're trying to sell it to publishers, nobody's interested in that. That's not important. Why don't you write a book about trendy African American food? <laughs> oh, so y'all can appropriate it? Okay. Um, I see you. But um, and one, one editor, I remember going to this big thing in New York, in the 2012 conference, and everybody was in the buying the food industry, but Batali was there. Shh. Um, all of them, all of them were there. Melissa Clark was there, Francis Lamb was there, everybody. And we're going to this, 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 meet this uh, session about new cookbooks, what editors are looking for, what agents are looking for. And it was like, if you don't have nine, listen to this, if you don't have 900 Twitter followers, you're nobody. <laughs> well, now that's, that's, that's not even a number, right? And I remember going up, I was so, they, were, they were like, we want stories that no one's ever heard about. We want stories that are unique. 
We want different perspectives. We don't just want the same old things. We want write food writing and cookbook writing, new stuff. I was excited. I said, okay, I got all those. <laughs> so I hopped up there, very naive. Editor looked at me and said, how do you know anyone would be interested in your family history? Oh, shucks. <laughs> and you know how you have like one minute to get your message across and the business card and that's it? Mm -hmm. So she totally talked to her friend for the, for the rest of the minute, handed me her crumpled last business card and said, give me a call. Okay, that's not going to work. Then this other editor lady said, I don't, she was from Texas, she says, I don't think that's a, I don't think the idea of writing a history of African American food from the perspective of a of, of black family which is very interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then she goes, you should, you get ready for this, Nancy. Okay. She said, you should write a book about my husband's family. Oh, oh you know it's going to go there. <laughs> wait, wait, y'all ain't ready, y'all ain't ready. She said, she said, she said, she said, my husband's family left Tennessee to go to Texas right before the Civil War to get away from the Yankees. Mm. Oh. In the first wagon, oh, don't do it. <laughs> In the first wagon were my husband's family. In the second wagon were all their possessions. And in the third wagon, don't say it, yeah. were your people. Oh. 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 Hot grease, hot grease is fire, just say it. <laughs> And I was like, I can't believe that I've got to go through all these hoops. But you know something? Now I appreciate it. Yeah. Because I because if it was just, okay, sure, the gates are open for you, I wouldn't have worked as hard as I did to prove the point I had to make. Yeah. And I don't want this to be the last book on this, and I want other people of other backgrounds to own their stories and carry them on. Because there's so many stories of people and of women and of poor people who have never been heard before. And the food industry is just one thing. So I'm glad I had I can I can laugh now so that other people can have the opportunity that I did to be able to tell stories that people need to hear. Because food is about every aspect of who we are. And it tells you all kinds of stories. And I thought about this at that same thing. Someone said to me very nicely, you know, nobody really knows who you are, and um, you've got all these complex identities and blah, blah, blah. And then I really thought about that, y'all, and I said, yes, and as a historian, I know what happens when no one knows who you are. It means you get forgotten. It means that they can look back 100 years from now and go, oh, those kind of people never existed. They didn't have a voice. They didn't matter. And so that's why I'm just like, no, I'm telling you right now, you, God put you through the things he put you through to make you learn the lesson you need to learn yep. to grow up a little higher. Yep. You shake it off and you step up. And you get a strong stomach. Because Lord knows I want to get the woman to chop the pie. She'd come talking about your people in the third wagon. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I was like, no, she didn't. <laughs> she had, we say in the South, she had more nerve than a broken tooth. <laughs> well, we're to, unfortunately, I have the, you know, don't, don't hate me. Um, we've got people waiting in the next room. If I could have you move out this way, that would be much appreciated. Thank you so much. Michael will be up top doing a book signing at 2 o'clock. If you have not purchased, it's up at the visitor center. If you have not purchased his book, highly recommend it. He didn't ask me to. Picture it is. Thank you. Thank you, man. 